What's up, everyone? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long. Today I have Jack Schwarzy, number seven, in the chat. Um, Jack is uh, coming on the middle of the day. You know, I've been in contact with Jack. He's uh, see what he's up to. He was on the podcast last year. Wow, it's been a while, man. It must be over like six yeah. months now. Maybe like September. September. Yeah, probably. Like longer. All right. But yeah, um, you should check that podcast out. That was a good podcast. And now we're here. I decided to catch up with Jack, see how he's going, things are going. Um, and yeah, so yeah, Jack, you want to give a brief background on yourself and like where you're from, how you guys started trading? Yeah. Um, get, you know, get a freshen up. I'm from right in the middle of the United States. I'm in Missouri. And I got started in trading through like Tim Sykes. I saw him on Instagram and then I just started kind of diving into it while I was in high school. And then when I went away to college, I just kept going crazy with the studying like every day. And I was always like a horrible trader at the time. I mean, two, two and a half years of just like trying to figure out how to trade. I was just making the same mistakes again and again. And then I finally switched to like the short side of things. And then I just started building my account. I blew it up. And then I just kept blowing that account up. And then I finally was able to like build it all back up and more since like 2020 through 2021. And now. Yeah. Um, you want to maybe talk briefly about that 80, what was it like you build it up to like 80 K and then you lost a majority yeah. of it. And then you have to make a check out to Cobra and drive over there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was specifically, that was like 2019 from February all the way into like May. Uh, I was pretty much just showing like every day one gap. And like, I mean, there were a ton of day one gaps too. Like so I'm talking like hundred percent in the morning and you just hit it short and it would be fading 70%. It would just work like a clock. And you were almost just printing money with that setup at the time. And then I think nowadays it's just like a little too overcrowded. So you have to be very particular about what you're doing. But back then I was just shorting everything recklessly. And then I got in like one scenario in like late May where it was like a $1 stock. So it was cheap. And I think it was like biotech and it just kept getting bidded up like every single penny. And I probably stopped out like 15, 30 times and lost like 30,000 of my $80,000 account that day. Then ever since then, it was such a big loss. I couldn't really comprehend it and like materialize how to cope with that. So I just kept coming back to the market, trying to like slam stuff and make it back. So it was just like revenge trading and revenge trading can just go on forever pretty much if like you don't make your money back then you're just going to keep revenge trading until you say okay this isn't going to work and it just took me a long time to say that yeah um do, do you still like remember that the, the trauma from that or the rules that you set moving forward from that like did that like still play a role I, the reason why i ask is because a couple of days ago i interviewed bryce foos i don't know if you're you know him. Mm -hmm. he's another trader in st louis by the way mm -hmm. So, yeah, he was like, oh, yeah, Jax is in St. Louis, isn't he? And I was like, yeah. So he, he's actually the episode right before you. Yeah. But um, he was mentioning right before this one. But he was mentioning how, like, the the, the trauma, like, from DRYS. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, he shorted that. And, like, I think he blew up or something. But uh, he, he had a big loss. But, like, he still remembers how to stay disciplined and, like, follow rules because of that. Mm -hmm. That's always in the back of his mind. Do you have a oh, similar yeah. situation, like, with, with um? with those instances? Oh yeah. Um, so, I mean, I actually got really lucky with INDO last night because like I was holding about 15,000 shares short all day yesterday when it was in like the eights and it grinded, it just kept supporting all day. And then it, I think it like cracked the day low almost. And I covered like 5,000 shares and then it just kept going up. And like, I had no intention to really even cover it, but the market was closed. I still had 10,000 shares short. And I'm like, man, this just, there's just something wrong about holding short right here. And like, I was just staring at my computer screens thinking like, this doesn't really feel right. So like I started covering a bunch and I covered like 8,000 shares and I'm like, you know, it's green on the day. It's traded a pretty significant amount of volume. It was about like, I think it was like 50% of the previous day runs volume. So I'm like, it's, there's, there's nothing that's like not super bearish about this chart. And, yeah, I mean, that was one of the things I'm like, okay, and then if it gaps down, I'll just, you know, make a thousand bucks. And like, that's pretty modest. So like, why not? And then it spiked up and I'm like, okay, yeah, it was definitely a bad idea to hold it overnight. So I just covered the rest. And it was no big deal, like 970 or 10, do something like that. So like, even though I love to really push size, 
I still do keep that in the back of my head to answer your question, like with just the risk. Yeah, I got you. So, so that's INDO. So, okay, so right now, we, that's an oil and gas play, right? It was like a pump, apparently. Someone was saying it's a newsletter pump. Um, newsletters have been all over it. Like yesterday, yeah, massive short opportunity off the open because like you got ponytail boy, farmer boy, whatever, getting in there <laughs> and like jamming it in the eights. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to short this at 820. And like, boom, you know, it falls like a dollar and a half. Like that's still a huge game. You know, and like he makes it so much more predictable. And then, yeah, you've been following him for years, man. I remember like what, <laughs> since since you were like uh, under like you were a couple hundred grand in profits, you, you were mentioning that's how I found actually I found out about the ponytail guy <laughs> because of you. You mentioned them in the chat, and I was like, who is this guy? This is like this must have been 2019, I don't something like that. Yeah, oh, and yeah. I was like, oh, then actually, yeah, now. So, I, I started to pay attention to his um, video streams on YouTube. Uh huh. I almost got to upgrade my yeah, subscription. I, so you brought me on to this guy. <laughs> um, but um, okay. So so you were holding I in the overnight. So some so how often do you swing the shorts? Uh, you know, I'm really not afraid to swing shorts per se. Like I mean, okay, if you're doing like your whole account swinging a short, you you're asking for punishment. Like the nine gap up. Or like not, or to ten, that's a 50, 60 percent gap up. Like you can't be swinging like a massive line, you know. So like just making sure your size down is very good with any sort of like short swinging. But uh, I usually only swing on stuff that are like big supernovas that are like dead, or if it's something like ISPO, uh, it could spike 20, 25, 30 bucks against me, and I'm not really going to be scared to cover in that because I would just rather bad honestly because like it's a massive backside move in the progress in the process and how do you determine like to give you conviction to swing it is it like through experiences is it through data is it like you know first red day and then like you cover in the morning or um with like well it depends what kind of like uh swing short setup like there's a bunch of like day one stuff that they just chop around all day there's so much like volume coming in like 100 200 million shares and but like the stock's not really doing anything and then it makes the move overnight so it's like yeah that could kind of be one it's not like your best example of like swinging overnight but something like um like here let me look at like ispo for example like it had the massive day from where it like gapped down into like 60 70 had a little spike to 78 and it went all the way down to 46 and then the next day it gapped down again to 35 and I was holding the, it was only like a couple hundred shares short overnight, but like still you're waking up to $2,000, $3,000 off of just like that small little piece. Gotcha. And how, how often do you swing short? Like I know, okay, actually, so what, it, you do some longs now too, right? Or are you just mostly short? <sighs> I'm mostly short at the moment. And like, I'm doing like a lot of, actually I'm probably 50% swing shorts or I'm like, or at least I'm more profitable on the swing shorts than the intraday shorts at the moment. But uh, yeah, no, I've been staying away from longs. It's just tough for me. Like I wanted to buy probably spy. I wanted to buy spy calls this morning, you know, just throw some money at it and hit the bounce. But I kind of messed up on that. But I wish there were more long opportunities, but I just don't think there's like any super high conviction stuff. You know, I feel like 2020, 2021, you could just see all the shorts getting brewed together where they were just going to get squeezed super hard. Yeah, I got you. So another thing. So I saw um, you on like the, the Huddy's uh, stock therapy thing it was pretty cool. It was like five or six mm -hmm. of you guys there talking. And uh, I remember like Huddy was um, introducing you as like you like to look at the overall big picture of the company and mm -hmm. maybe go like by fundamentals a little bit or. So mm -hmm. how would you describe? And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting because I kind of trade a little similar like that as mm -hmm. well. Like I won't just go strictly through data or spreadsheets or whatever. Oh, how, yeah. what, like what's your process with going through that? Like the ideal scenario where, where um, you're looking to trade something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, for fundamentals, I do try to keep it very light just because, I mean, if you dig in the fundamentals, you can dig into one company and never stop. So like I look at the financial statements, like how much cash they have. And then I really like the income statement actually, because like that'll give you more of an idea of what their operations really are. Like, do they even pull money? Do they make revenue? 
And then are they losing it? Because like there are some companies that they're making revenue, but their cost of goods sold is just higher than it all. So it's like they're doing business, but they're not making money off the business that they're doing before they even take out like salaries and stuff and like general expenses, which I mean, that's always kind of funny. So like, then I'll kind of categorize them. Like, is this a super bad company? And like, I'll obviously look at um, uh, like higher value people's like opinions on Twitter and stuff. Like I'll search a ticker and I'll see like, is there somebody like Adam Fierstein just bashing this biotech like crazy or there's someone like that and like see what kind of due diligence other people have. I don't really look too hard for it, but then you can kind of get categorize them. Is this like the worst company I've ever seen? Is it like a, yeah, they're fine. Or it's like, Oh wow. They actually do pretty well for themselves. There was one company. Uh, it was like three months ago. It was just spiking super hard. And I looked at their financial statements. I'm like, man, they're, their business model is actually pretty freaking good. And I bought it. And then Friday after the close, I think it started going up like 60% after hours. And then the next day, like it all fell apart and I only made like a little bit, but I guess you still got to be a trader with it. Gotcha. So, so, okay. So you're looking at all that and uh, how does like market cap and float fit into that? Cause like if it's, let's say it's, it's a good company or whatever, it has good fundamentals but it's a it's got a diluted it's that a lot of dilution coming up or so or it's the opposite it's a Mm -hmm. bad company but it has a tiny float tiny market cap like cavil or or whatever Mm -hmm. (laughs) who knows oh yeah (laughs) um so how how do you what what are your like what's your your rules for that oh that's market cap and float it trumps all with me um like i think market cap it's always going to be like the main indicator of how much volume and like how much money can really flood into this company. And then from there, you can like get a bigger gauge of how strong of a move can possibly come. Like uh, ISPO, it was, it was a big cap company. I forget what the outstanding share count was, but I think it was like relatively big, but the float was allegedly like 250,000. So it's like, do you treat it like a, multi-billion dollar company or do you treat it like a little 50 million dollar company and my answer was treat it like a 50 million dollar company or like 60 80 100 million dollar company which is very small for something that's up to 100 bucks a share and like that's kind of how i was distinguishing like there's really not much more volume that can be flooding into this but that being said if it swiped up and i was short on the day it was gapping down, I would, I would have been panicking now for sure. Gotcha. Okay. So to refresh the memory of, of everyone. Okay. So ISPO, I think it was a D SPAC from a week ago and it caught, it went from like $10 to like a hundred or 110 or something like that. Yeah. And it caused the whole D SPAC kind of, you know, it's cousins. Theme. It's a like theme, I guess. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The sympathy theme. So like QNGY, um, CPTN, I think was one, uh, FRSD. I don't know. Uh, there's a few, but, um, but they all started jumping up because of this one. So ISPO was like the sector leader, uh, if you want to call that a sector. So like, um, I don't, I didn't trade ISPO. I traded like the other sympathy plays, but, um, like ISPO, I think it had like high locate fees and all that. So like you just won't, you, oh, yeah. you just like you'll have the conviction at a certain point that it reaches and it, it crosses all the check check marks in your boxes. And uh, you, mm-hmm. how how much do locate fees take apart? Like is it if it's too much or do you, does that play a role at all? It it totally does. Sometimes I I just override it. You know, like I used to have a thing where I would say like and I don't even want to say this just in case like a broker sees it. They're like, Oh, okay. That's his limit. So we can just juice him up to every time. But like, I would always say like, okay, I mean, 2% of market price. I, that, that's like my firm limit. I'm not even going to touch you. And I don't care like how much range there was intraday. If it was like 2% market price, I would just say, hey, screw you guys. It's not even worth it. But like right now I'm just, I've been going by like a fixed dollar amount. Cause like, I've been totally like re not revamping. I've just been tweaking my trading strategy lately to like be smaller, take easier gains, make it all simple. 
only really push like a heavy short sell buy in if it's like an insanely high conviction play because like I'm categorizing a lot of my like setups and patterns right now to you know skew the weights. But uh yeah, like I'll usually just stick to around 200 300 dollars like try to keep that like the max for a single stock on borrow fees. And but that being said, if it's like a five dollar stock and they're charging fifty cents, like just forget about it. If they're charging twelve to fifteen cents on a five dollar stock, still forget about it. Yeah, and uh, like ISP. So how how did you go about trading that? Because like that was that one was crazy. Yeah, so like- that was that's the one <laughs> example where I totally just like overrode it. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna short it. If I get shares, I'm gonna short it. I only found like nine hundred. Like nine hundred eighty four, actually. At eighty four dollars. Okay, so what was the what was the percentage up? What when, when you shorted it? it must have been like four or five hundred percent. Yeah, let's see. ISPO run from ten. I can tell you exactly where I shorted it. I actually, I think I shorted a yeah. So up from ten hits one ten. Then it gets down in the morning. Actually, I was long a little bit overnight. I was like, this thing could totally just jump again, hit the one eighty or something. It didn't. I took a loss there. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, <laughs> uh, uh, you never know how high these can go, man. It's crazy how yeah, yeah. imaginations are, you know? Oh, um, yeah. Did you, but you, you didn't box it though, right? You just, you had a, a long oh, no. Yeah, I, I just had a long overnight. And then I saw it in 96 and I'm like, oh man, I think I was totally right. And then it just slammed on me and I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm getting all the borrows I can. This is a short. And like, even at, uh, before the market even opened, I was, calling it out to my friend. I'm like, ready for this sub 50 close on ISPO. <laughs> and, and yeah, then I was hitting it in like 77 ish, I think. And like, I covered around an average of like 57. So, I mean, I can't even hit my own price targets. Gotcha. So, so um, did you have, what, what prior experience did you have like similar to ISPO? Cause like for me, I can't, I have no experience like that. I have never mm-hmm. traded something crazy like that. So I stay away from it. I've had oh, experience yeah. trading the sympathies though, so I felt comfortable with that. But like ISPO kind of reminds me of a move like DWAC or something, where it goes mm-hmm. from like ten dollars to like over a hundred. Did you trade DWAC as well? Um, I've, I've been trading it too much and been losing too often. I'm almost about to put it on the no touch list. I'm not like doing anything crazy, but I just want it to just fall apart. It won't, so I'm just moving it on. Won't. <laughs> I um, give up. Um, okay, and, and like, what fundamentals will you look at? You said like, um, you look at the balance sheet. Well, what about like dilution? Like, for example, I started using dilution tracker lately. I find it's pretty cool. It has like oh, a, I, the ATM and like the yeah, warrants. I, I love dilution tracker. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. Whatever they set up there, I just love it. But and then like other than that, I'll also I'll also assume I'll also like be looking at scans because they'll throw up honestly just as much fundamentals as i need i have it sets like market cap shares outstanding float um i think that's daily volatility number of trades and it'll have like cash debt revenue gross percent of insiders holding um and then institution so i mean that's a lot of the yeah fundamentals that i really even care to look at did you um so did you always like look at that stuff or is that like something you applied like the recently past year or two? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely a recently applied thing. I, uh, I was always technical trader and I was always taught like learn to be a technical trader first, then dive in the fundamentals. Cause like if I, I feel like just trading off fundamentals alone is so tough. Like you really have to build such a high conviction and then just, I mean, hold, which it'll probably become a bag hold first, but like, you'll just convince everybody that you know what you're doing. Whereas like technicals, you can really pace yourself and say like, okay, this position is winning for me. So I'm going to like add here, just risk here. And I don't know. I just always think technicals has to be like the overarching theme for trading, especially like intraday. Gotcha. Okay. And also, so you, you got your master's in like quantitative uh, finance, I think. Congrats, by the way, man. It's it's pretty impressive. So you're like a genius now. <laughs> so, Piece of paper says I. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what did you learn from school that applies? Like, what what are the, what's some, what are some takeaways? There's got to be something that's useful for trading. Uh, yeah, learn programming. Programming is cool because it just makes it so much easier to like 
edit data and stuff. And then like, if you have like a bunch of just numbers and paper, you can just like chop it up and then make a spreadsheet out of it, so to speak, which is also a lot easier. I've had to do that like once or twice. So you can program like your own scanners and your own like algorithms and stuff like. Mm -mm, I'm not that good. <laughs> have you seen Tim Grittani like on, on Kinfo? I don't know if you're, you know about Kinfo, K-I-N-F-O. He has oh, like yeah. uh, something listed there as like a, tracking his um his algo Ritani has an algo oh now. yeah yeah I, I came across that once i think i think it's up like 300 grand it's just a, and like i don't think it's like that developed you know so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's scary what it's scary <laughs> that is just crazy i need an algorithm yeah there's a Ritani algo we need a number seven algo yeah <laughs> so, it'll, it'll, probably, it'll probably just short everything until it blows up <laughs> <laughs> so okay so we got a few minutes here so um what about your most memorable ticker like from last year oh yeah you want to talk about like last year versus this year like what what have you recognized well, yeah, so yeah. far that's a really good topic actually um what i've recognized is that there are no just massive washes and massive spikes going straight up like one of the things that made 2020 so awesome for everybody is that like every single strategy was able to profit if you were a scalper, you were going to hit your scalps. If you were going for only home runs, you were hitting like five of them a week. You know, like there's just so much like up and down momentum. Whereas now it's like, I feel like there's a lot more stuff. Like even INDO today, it's taken all day to go down three bucks when there were like $10, $12 worth of range. Like, you know, from after the market open, I guess it's more like four to five, but you know, like back in 2020, if it was a massive parabolic in the pre-market on a multi-day like play, it would wash out all the way red. Whereas this one, it's still hanging two and a half bucks in the green. So I feel like it's more important than ever just like to trade smaller, have make sure you have your wiggle room, then just like take gains as they come. And that's or like in other cases, why I'm swing shorting so much, just figure out how to position yourself where you have a comfortable risk and then just let the chart go. And because there's so many like downtrends that are in the making at the moment. And that's what I've been trying to like work on capitalizing. Gotcha. So, so I know like, like uh, so far 2022, I know I, some, a trader like told me, Oh, it feels like we're playing ping pong, you know, like you just uh -huh. back and forth, like getting nowhere. Um, put it. Yeah. So what do you think about it? You know, it's disappointing too, because like last year was such a good year for a lot of mm -hmm. traders, uh, for me, for sure. And uh, like, you want to do better. You want to always beat the previous year, but it's like, you've you got to, as a trader, you got to recognize this. It's not going to be the same. So, you know, you got to mm -hmm. slow your roll a little bit. So how do you, how do you deal with that? Like you just size down. Yeah. Just, um... yeah um, so after my ISIG trade, which, oh God, it, was, it's, it hurts me to this day. I had like a lot of shares short from the highs at 28. And I was just swing shorting it for days. I was probably up like $150,000. And it grinded all the way back up and squeezed me out. After that, I just said like, like that made me so mad, so annoyed to like have that happen. Then especially have it go back down that I'm just like, I, I can't do this like it's totally a different year and if i just keep trying to fight it i'm just going to dig myself into a deeper hole and until like you really understand that if you don't like swallow your pride and realize that you can't just be smacking home runs every day or even every week really or even every month in this year probably then you're just going to keep digging yourself into a hole and that's what the it really is the toughest thing but it, it really does just start with uh swallowing your pride and realizing that like the reason we made so much money in 2020 and 2021 is because the market was great. The fed was pumping money. There were more people than ever that started trading, but now those uh, new traders, they're just slowly being thinned out. And um, so, yeah, it's just going to naturally get harder because the curve on how like dumb the money is, it's getting, uh, it's coming up on like smart traders where, there can only be like theoretically 10% of very profitable traders, right? Or just profitable traders, I guess. But like when there's 30 million new traders coming in, it's much easier to be in the 10%, right? Yeah. 
Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Um, and you mentioned earlier, okay, so like shorting used to be a lot different, like in 2019, you said it's like overcrowded now too. So how does that factor in? Like over oh, man, short just selling? insanely high borrow fees. Uh, I think it means that like going forward, it's going to be more about like being proactive on the cover side or, or just waiting for like those moments where everybody is blown out and there are no shorts left and then short and something like that, because then there's going to be a lot of long selling then all the shorts are going to want to sell in. Then, then that's where like the real selling pressure is going to come from. But I think it is going to start with being more proactive on just taking gains, shorting, Gotcha. And um, this whole current market situation past week or so uh, with the whole Russia and all that, how are you going about that? Like you're looking at macro stuff, you're looking at certain sectors, you're looking uh, for, like, what are you looking for? I have a dip. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, man. Honestly, I don't really follow politics too much. I probably should, but uh, it's just not really something that I like to get into. I feel like with politics it will make so many people just like very sensitive to it and i don't know i like to keep uh my head just right on the spy that is my politics and i say does it look like a good price to buy sure then i'll buy it <laughs> gotcha um and what about like oil and gas plays or like cybersecurity? because like right before we started this podcast i started shorting um i forgot the name or it starts with an i uh irnt i think it was oh yeah <laughs> Iron cyber Net. security and uh, some bullshit <laughs> article came out saying like someone wrote up a quick article and i think atlas started pumping it so <laughs> i don't know man they're breaking out over that uh big like 70 68 million volume candle yeah so I don't know, it could be good yeah we're, we're getting some buy. volatility i mean today i saw some volatility there was even some people saying mm -hmm. oh uh, the market might halt today when I when I woke up. <laughs> I don't know about that. The 2020, remember that? Like, um, oh yeah, dude, that was just there. that was ridiculous. I remember filming videos of it. I'm like, what? Because it was the first ever like overall market halt. Yeah, that was you know, the first they time. introduced it after like 2011 or 20 2008. That's right, and then it did it again like two weeks later or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Insane. Insane. My favorite part was when like the Fed came out with their bill that like they were going to pump three trillion five trillion i don't know how many trillions into the market and then that same day the market just dropped the, the day after then it started going up that's what that will always blow my mind the v-shaped recovery like no other <laughs> yeah. I was like they issued the news and then they fell and i'm like what <laughs> insane um yeah all right and to wrap it up because this is like a quicker podcast all right so uh, any any book recommendations Oh, yeah. This was so I used to work at this one place that was like a Forex research firm. And it was so cool because like that was my first time ever where I was like around just people trading. They didn't trade stocks like I did, but they all traded like currency pairs and commodities. And one of the, like my manager knew that I was really into like short selling, like all these massive penny stocks that just blow up. And he was totally on board with the idea. He thought it was awesome. But I think in the way that like I spoke, he realized that like, man, this kid's going to get himself into trouble one day. So he's like, promise me you'll read this book before, like, you know, just read it. Otherwise, one day something bad might happen. You won't know what's going on. And it was what I learned losing a million dollars by uh, Jim Paul, I think. Nice. I, I haven't uh, never heard of that one. So that now I'm, yeah. that's on the list. Um, that's an awesome book. Love it. Uh, I didn't read it and I blew up. So. Oh, you didn't read it, so you read it after you blew up. I read it after I blew up. <laughs> I'm like, man, I owe this guy. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so it came full circle. Yeah, so, 100%. Wait, so wait a second. So when, when did you work for that firm? I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, that was back in 2018. I really don't talk about it too much. I was there for uh, like half a summer and then for a semester. So you were getting, you were, uh, you're getting some like started, I guess. Is that when you were in the Tim Challenge also? Um, I yeah, feel like, yeah, 2018, yeah, huh? probably so for a brief period. Um, in the real world, so you were <laughs> always interested. Okay, now you're so what, what are you oh, yeah. gonna do with the quant finance stuff? You just have it, uh, for honestly, I really those? just honestly, I really just want to dive more into statistics, like learn just learn about statistics as like math more. Yeah, that's really what I like to. I think there's just so much power in that. 
So you do want to bring, so, okay, so you want to be like a full rounded, well-rounded trader. Like the, you want to get the stats, the technical, mm-hmm. the fundamentals. You're trying to get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah like if cool. somebody likes to talk math and finance, I want to be able to talk that. Or if they want to talk fundamental, I want to be able to like converse with that. Just be able to do it all. I think one day I'll get into all the psychotic technical indicators. Like, I don't even know what they are, man, but there's so many out there. One day I'll dive into that, but that's definitely on the back burner. Gotcha. And then finally, um, where do you see yourself in the future with trading? Oh, man, I just see myself. Hopefully one day I'm just like a whale in the market and I outsize small caps. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I hope for. Yeah. Cool. Then I can just come to play when those DWAC moments come in. You just short infinite amount of shares in the hundreds. Did you did you ever you know this book Momo Traders that Nate Michaud uh part of? So there's one chapter in there. I don't know if you read it, but there's one chapter talking about this whale kind of guy. And uh they're like, what's your strategy? He says, Oh, just add, and then when I get squeezed, I go to I go to bed and I wake up and I just keep adding. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, that's his strategy. Just take a nap. Go oh to bed. wait. <laughs> yeah, I do have the book. I only read like 10 pages of it. I'll have to read it's, through it's all a great book. Find no, the guy. It's a fun book to read. Um, yeah. I was on it also. Modern Rock. Got some other people in there. Yeah. Good book. But yeah, Jack, thanks again for coming on the podcast, man. It's great catching up with you, bro. Yeah, you too, David. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely, man. I'll see you in the chat room. Yep. Right. See you. Bye.